Hi, I'm Kirby Allison. I'm back here in London at Burn and Burge with Dominic Casey, shoemaker extraordinaire, great friend, uh, and someone uh, for whom it is not a trip if I don't see in London. So, uh, Dominic, Likewise. thank you so much uh, yeah. for um, for uh, taking some time to hang yeah. out with us. And we've got some great goodies here. Yep. And uh, you know, Dominic, one of the things that I just love most about you is just your passion for shoemaking, right? I mean, you have a true passion, not just in the craft, but in mm. its history. Yeah. Uh, and you've really kind of taken up shoemaking history as kind of a, as a hobby. I mean, in some ways you're an amateur historian and you've done yeah. a great deal of research on a lot of different subjects kind of in and around shoemaking. Mm -hmm. And one of them for which I know that we share a similar interest on is in the Wellington boot. Yes. Yeah. And the Duke of Wellington. And the Duke of Wellington. And I suspect today we are going to um, open a whole new can of worms yes, in down, Wellington boot Down world. the proverbial we are, rabbit hole. We are we heading about. down <laughs> a rabbit hole. Um, and it should be an interesting journey because obviously what we're going to be doing is talking about something completely different from shoemaking. Yeah. We're talking about the history of long boot making and we're really looking at a kind of a living historical document really a yeah. living historical piece of work you mm -hmm. know these the we're going to be to go we're going to be heading back to uh, the 19th century and looking yeah. at boot making in the 19th century the early days of boot making how they made them and really um how we still make them today yeah um that's what we're going to be yeah. looking at well i mean if shoemaking is uh, let's say an endangered trade or an endangered craft i mean boot making is uh, you know almost at extinction, yeah. right? Because it is a completely different trade and craft than even bespoke shoemaking. Is that right? Yeah, and this is. Uh, I mean, traditionally in the shoemaking world, you used to get um, shoemakers, and then you used to get long boot makers. Okay, and they were the people that sort of specialized. They were different in, people. They were tended to be different, different people. people. I yeah. mean, Generally. years ago in London, within sort of five square miles of here. Uh, 50 years ago, there would be six or seven firms of bespoke bootmakers. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd be making riding attire and military boots, really. Yeah. And and they were very different. The whole, that whole kind of business yeah. was different from shoemaking. Yeah. Now, um, you get uh, shoemakers like classically Maxwell's were the great riding bootmakers. Mm -hmm. Um, and the great long boot makers over in Dover Street, just yeah. across the way there. And of course, um, the boots that you've got standing in your office, yes. that all, everyone a very sees kind whenever, gift from you. yeah, w w whenever anyone looks at uh, a, a film of yours yeah. when you're in your office, mm -hmm. there's those, that beautiful pair of Maxwell's yeah. Wellington boots standing there. Perched right and next to the humidor. Exactly, next to the humidor, perfect place for it. And I mean, we've always talked about yeah. perhaps we really would be nice project mm -hmm. to think about making a pair of Wellington boots for you yeah. that really copy those. Mm -hmm. Those probably came from about 1910 or so, really? yeah. probably over 100 years old. Um, but there is a modern pair of Wellington boots is as stylish today as even then, really. Yeah. And subsequently, because you've just had your cowboy boots mm -hmm. made, we'll look at the history of the Wellington boot, where it came from and how it um, actually morphed into the structure is exactly the same okay. as the cowboy boot that Lee Miller made for you. Yeah. There's a, a number of sort of distinct variations, mm -hmm. but essentially it's very similar to okay. the cowboy boot making. Yeah. Well, how so, was the uh, Wellington boot different than what preceded it? Because the Wellington boot, you know, really from a boot making perspective is a rather modern, uh, you know, invention. Right? Yeah. I mean, it wasn't until what the mid to late, About 18, 1820, yeah. 1830, okay. when things started to change. And um, what happens, I've got a couple of pictures here. Mm -hmm. So um, here is a picture of um, Wellington All right. in his uniform, mm -hmm. uh, showing a, a classic stage of English dressing. I mean, for English gentlemen, the military style really affected the classic style on the street, really. So we both got two gentlemen wearing essentially breeches and their boots on the outside of mm -hmm. their breeches. Yeah. Um, this is a classic Hessian boot, which a lot of military soldiers wore. Um, so uh, it's got tassels on the front of it, a slight V-shaped top, mm -hmm. um, tight to the leg. It was a riding military boot. Mm -hmm. And what Wellington, what was happening at that period is that um, gentlemen's dress was changing. Mm -hmm. And um, gentlemen were beginning to wear their trousers 
uh, tr trousers rather than breeches. And so they were thinking about, here's a painting and portrait of Wellington later in life, but he's wearing his boots underneath his trousers. Inside the trousers, So that yeah. was a classic change mm -hmm. in all of men's attire there. Yeah. And so one day, um, Wellington went into his bootmaker's, Holbys, mm -hmm. um, which is on St. James's Street. Mm -hmm. um, and he said to him, look, um, I'd really like you to make me a different type of boot. So I'm in my riding boots all day long. I'm in my britches. Uh, I'm in my army boots. What I'd like is a, a softer, lower cut, lighter pair of boots, something mm -hmm. that I could wear in the evening, something that I could go out to dinner with, to restaurants, etc., go to yeah. their clubs in. And so he asked him to design a different style of boot. Yeah. And it and still would have been a boot at that time because in London you were still riding. Yes. Right? So, I mean, you would have Always needed still a, riding. a boot. Exactly. Uh, and the streets weren't particularly, you know, yeah. I mean, they weren't paved like they were today. So you still would be mucking about, you know, you know, in puddles. And so you needed a proper boot in order to really protect yeah. the foot. Exactly. So, I mean, just out of interest. So here is a picture of, here is, um, uh, St. James's Street, okay. around about 1820. Mm -hmm. um, this is a famous club called the uh, Crockford's Club, which is a real sort of bit of a uh, uh, sort of a gambling den as much as anything okay. else. But it really <laughs> yeah. shows you mm -hmm. the style of dress and what was happening yeah. in St. James's Street, where you actually stay yeah. when you actually come. Mm -hmm. Your club, the Carlton Club that Wellington founded, is just a bit further down the street here. Mm -hmm. But um, next door to this building, which still exists today, mm -hmm. that's the Guards Club. So that was founded in 1810. Mm -hmm. And it, um, it's now called the Guards and Cavalry Club, okay. which is around in Piccadilly. Okay. But originally, 1810 to 1813, it was the Guards Club. Mm -hmm. And Hobie, the bootmakers, unfortunately, was right next door to the Guards. <laughs> it was just yeah. there. So it doesn't actually exist in the picture. I've been desperately looking for a picture of Wellington's bootmakers. So what we get is a sense of the street, people riding around, the Guards Club here, and the bootmakers was right next door yeah. to the Guards Club. And it's so, a real indication of the fact that Hobie, you know, would have been a bootmaker to kind of the, the gentry, the, yeah, you know, the kind gentry. of the ruling class, the, you know, the gentlemen class, of the day. Uh, uh, officers and gentlemen, they yeah. literally came from the Glads Club mm -hmm. and walked into the bootmakers next door. Yeah. Everybody went there. Hobie's okay. was, he employed 300 bootmakers in his <sighs> business. It's incredible. It was a huge business yeah. making boots, riding boots, purely yeah. and simply because everybody went everywhere on horses. Yeah. So riding boots and riding boot making was, uh, yeah. you know, shoemaking was almost at this period, not non-existent, but the majority of the men and gentlemen would have worn long boots. Were boot making, Were right. Boot -making. Versus, yeah. I guess, transitioning in the late 19th century early 20th to being primarily shoe focused. Shoes, exactly, yeah. yes. It would have gone through a period when it went more into sort of ankle boots, mm -hmm. the Victorian period, batten boots, okay. lace up boots, ankle boots, mm -hmm. the early Chelsea boots were made then, and then it would move more into shoes. Yeah. So, but what we're really talking about with the Wellington is, you know, when everybody was riding. Yeah. So, I mean, interestingly enough, at um, Woolmer Castle in Kent is where uh, Wellington died. Okay. Um, and they've still got his bedroom there and they've got a lot of Wellington memorabilia here. And they've got a very first pair of the Wellington boots that he had wow. made. Um, those interestingly look, those look enough, really soft. They are really soft. And we'll actually go into actually, as you can see, there's some Wellington boots on the table here and the leg. Well, I think we may as well actually talk about a pair now. Here is, you know, a beautiful pair of old Wellington boots. Classically, what you see is the leg is as soft as soft can be. Yeah. Wow. So okay. that was designed to be, it's unlined. Mm -hmm. It's uh, very soft. We'll look at some materials later, but it's essentially a very soft goat skin. Really? So okay. you've got the calf on the vamp mm -hmm. and the heel counter, yeah. which gives it the, the strength and the stability and the mm -hmm. structure but the leg is completely soft and crushable. Mm -hmm. So that's really what he was aiming for yeah. in terms of a boot. Would they have been worn with spurs? Um, of course, if they were riding, mm -hmm. they would have worn them with spurs. But essentially, these are spur boxes which are set into the heels yeah. of the boots. So a lot of times they would have taken the spurs out yeah. um, and not worn them with spurs. Yeah. Wasn't this uh, an innovation of Maxwell's, didn't they? 
invent this? Um, I don't have know. it patented. I mean, because this was a rather remarkable kind of innovation of the time of yeah. being able to. I mean, that you know, certainly is something. Basically, insert and remove your spurs yeah. without much hassle. Yeah, exactly. And I think this was. I mean, if you look at these I ones in the um, Woolmer Castle, these boots here. Uh, interestingly enough, I don't think these were his. Just from a bootmaking perspective, they said that they were one of his first Wellingtons. I think these were ones designed specifically more for riding because yeah, they did right. upside down. Yep. They did have, um, yeah. Try not to break these. Exactly. Priceless. So artifact. anyway, I, bought, I, I have pulled part, I, just for us to talk about later. So yeah. I've pulled part a pair of Wellingtons. So this is a very old um, pair of Wellingtons. Wow. There's the heel and it just goes, it shows you Gosh, how look the Look at box, these old nails. Yeah. So it just shows you how the spur box is recessed and set yeah. into the, um, and this is just, this is a sort of modern version of a spur box. Oh, really? So those okay. are the, if I was making, and, and occasionally I do make um, mm -hmm. boots with spur boxes in, that's- So this would be integrated into the heel. That's built into the heel. Yeah. So actually as you build up the lifts and the layers mm -hmm. of the heel, the actual spur box is cut and set into the heel. So that it just means that it's actually, it, it can either look like a normal boot without any spurs in it. Yeah. Um, and I suppose when you actually begin to look at this, you can begin to see where those cowboy boots that Lee Miller, it, this is the same structure as the mm -hmm. cowboy boot that Lee Miller made for you. Um, and essentially it's the same number of pieces. It's got a vamp, mm -hmm. it's got a heel counter at the yeah. back, it's got a front leg and a mm -hmm. back leg, and it's seamed along the side. Yeah. Which so is the you, same way a cowboy boot would have been made. Exactly the same way as a cowboy boot was made. So if you actually pull one apart, I mean, when Lee Miller made your cowboy boots, basically they made the modern version mm -hmm. of that and that, mm -hmm. and then stitched the whole things together. Yeah. So I pulled this one apart just so that we could look at the structure. This is, this is a pair of very old battered ones yeah. that I found in an antique shop that had been worn for absolutely hundreds of years and had a lot of repair work done to them. So they'd fallen apart. So I just pulled them apart just so that we could actually look more at the internal structure because what Wellington wanted to have done was to have something which had a very soft collapsible leg. Mm -hmm. So what he did was that they took out all of the leg lining here. Okay. So it's just lined along the top, top. there. It's lined along the top and all of the rest of the leg has no lining in it yeah. at all, which makes it soft. And a riding um, boot, a traditional riding boot would have had a bat long back seam, yes. right? And it would have had no seam on the side because you wanted to be able to feel the horse. Exactly, different structure yeah. entirely. This is a, a Wellington, which then goes on to become your cowboy boot structure. Although originally, um, probably the first Wellingtons were just actually two pieces of leather. So they were, uh, and the ones uh, which they have at Warmer Castle, mm -hmm. which are, you know, is an interesting pair of Wellingtons. Um, uh, they've got spur boxes on them. They've got a very low heel. They've virtually got no heel at all. So I suspect they were riding boots. Okay. They call them Wellingtons. I suspect that they were more riding boots mm -hmm. because we would expect to see more of a heel for walking. Uh, but on, wouldn't on you have wanted a heel boots. on you know, on a riding boot to help with the stirrups? Yeah, to hold with the stirrups in as well, yes. Yeah. So they're, what I'm saying is they're a very strange pair of yeah. boots. So okay. I've not actually yeah. really, whatever they've <laughs> Put your got finger there, it, yeah. I've not really seen what type of boots um, they've got. But um, yeah, so a riding boot would be different in structure again with, a, uh, is a completely different structure really. Mm -hmm. So this is a very specific way of actually making a pair yeah. of boots. And what about, I mean, what about the construction in the process of making a pair of boots is different than shoemaking. Yeah. Because it's well, totally different is, from yeah. what you've, you've told me. Yeah. I mean, so what we, um, first of all, I mean, the, one of the real primary differences is if a lot of the upper is actually hand sewn. Okay. So we know from shoemaking that a lot of the bottom part is hand sewn. Yeah. Now, occasionally in shoes, you get um, hand stitching on the uppers, mm -hmm. you get the lakes, you get the aprons, yeah. you get the Norwegian styles, mm -hmm. where you actually get a small amount of either decorative hand stitching, mm -hmm. uh, primarily decorative hand stitching yeah. uh, on uppers. Um, what we actually have to understand about these boots mm -hmm. is that the majority of this is actually hand sewed. Really? Um, yeah. So and is that by necessity that, or is that just a relic of Well, that I think time? this is a relic of, 
this is this one is certainly a relic of that time.、Mm-hmm. The ones that you actually have in your office are、mm-hmm. a combination of hand sewing. The vamps are hand sewn,、mm-hmm. which is a traditional riding boot thing. Okay.、Um, the、um, the backs are machine stitched. Really. On、okay. the ones in yours, round about nineteen ten. This is an older pair. This is virtually all hand sewn. All of this upper is hand sewn. This incredibly detailed seam along here, where they're joining the leg. Onto the vamp of the boot.、Mm-hmm. That's a hand stitched seam that you can barely see.、Oh, And、wow. again, the the,、um, the seam at the back is hand sewn as well. So I've kind of pulled this one apart just so that you could take a look at those tiny white hand stitches made from thread in yeah. there. Yeah. And that just goes to show where the the whole of the back was hand stitched with these tiny small white stitches. And that finesse just made a more comfortable boot. Yeah, and then again, all the way up the side, we've got the white stitches running along、mm-hmm. through here. These are all tiny hand sewn stitches、yeah. all the way along. So this back and this front uh, was uh, put in some clams like that. And just as the way they made your cowboy boots, the only difference being is they actually hand sewed them together like that. Really? So、yeah. that's the way that was made. That was the way that yeah, was. Though, I mean, the work is incredible. So the work、uh, that goes、extensive. into this is just <laughs> extensive, and、um, you know, almost some, something that you almost wouldn't see these days.、Yeah. You know, just purely and simply because the sheer expense and the ability to actually get the craftsmen to actually make these things. Well, there's so, not many craftspeople, craftsmen around that that know how to do a bespoke riding boot or Wellington boot no, anymore. I mean, it's probably literally a handful. Yeah. There's very few.、Yeah. There is very few, and so I mean, it's full of、um, minute details that、mm-hmm. make these things really distinctive.、Yeah. And that's really before we actually begin to make the bottom and start thinking about sewing in the heel lifts as、mm-hmm. well. So the back of the boot is sewn in, so that when you, I mean, the only way you can really get these things off is to actually. Uh, the thing about long boots is that they come with a whole set of paraphernalia to <laughs>、okay. go with them. You know, the whole business can come with things like,、um, you know, the spurs. There's、um, a whole selection of different types of. You often see them in antique shops,、yeah. boot pulls, which are the things which、uh, these get. So you often see the loops sticking out、mm-hmm. of the riding boot and stuff. These were the things which were designed、yeah. to slot into the.、Yeah. The loops like that, and to actually pull your、yeah. boots on, and that was so, necessary because, again, there's no lacing. There's no lacing, it, so in、yeah. order for your foot to be secured, it had to be a tight fit here at the mouth. Fiendishly、yeah. tight. I mean, when I was fitting riding boots as a young man, the old boys used to say to me, "If you don't spend ten minutes getting your boots on, they don't fit you." <laughs> okay. Because I mean, anyone can you can make a throat wide enough、yeah. for a foot just to fall into yeah. it. Yeah. You know, that, that's kind of easy.、Mm-hmm. The, the the real Pure science is to actually make it just about wide enough so、yeah. you can actually get your foot into it,、yeah. and then it doesn't actually slip up and down、yeah. at the back of the heel. Well, Lee Miller、so、talks about just how difficult that is. That's really,、right. really difficult. Yeah, so that's a really hard,、um, hard journey. So,、um, and that's the key, really,、mm-hmm. to actually get make it wide enough to get your foot in.、Um, so, and then. Actually, fitting enough on the instep across here to actually hold your foot, so that when your foot flexes,、mm-hmm. it doesn't actually come across, come up on the instep here and hold your foot in the back of the boot. Okay. Really, anyone can make a pair of boots which are too big. Yeah. You know, so that you can swim about in them and just put them on.、Yeah. But it takes a different type of thing to actually make、yeah. a, a really proper fitted、yeah. long boot. And this is why、um, a, a proper long boot, you know, traditionally and really up until recently, would have always been made bespoke. Is that in order to kind of hit that, you really had to have quite small tolerances. Yes. You couldn't do it ready to wear because you'd slip about. Yeah. You'd yeah, and you'd roll about it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's、um, yeah. Yeah. So that's、and、that's how, one of the things that、yeah. we have to consider. Yeah. And how much more difficult? I mean, talk to me a little bit about the difference in construction between a Wellington boot and say a riding boot, because I've seen on your Instagram photographs of you making a riding boot, and you're using、yeah. the. Clam, yeah, you know, in order to, to last, last it the, because there's、yeah. so much. The leather is so thick. There's so much hard countering. Yeah, that、um, you know you couldn't possibly hand last it. You've got to actually use kind of、yeah. a vice to pull、yeah. that leather over. That's mainly because of the material that you're making the riding boot in. I、okay. mean, the riding boot is really designed to be actually ridden.、Uh, 
over fences, through hedges, you know, if yeah. you're in the field hunting, mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to be jumping over all kinds yeah. of stuff, falling off, and it's really as much protection. So the, the, the material is very thick very and thick. very heavy. But that yeah. would be different so than a Wellington boot. It, it, a Wellington boot is mainly, so what we'll be making your Wellington boot in, we may as well just have a look at some of the materials. The Wellington boot, so um, your, uh, the vamp and the heel counter will just be the kind of plas classic black calf. Okay. So that's exactly mm -hmm. what you've had in a lot of your Oxford shoes okay. and stuff. So it makes a nice firm boot. Mm -hmm but it doesn't make anything like a, a, riding a, a traditional riding boot. Okay. And that's what Wellington wanted. He yeah. wanted a boot that he could go out in the evening, yeah. walk down the street and, and go to dinner with and be comfortable in, yeah, yeah. without the sheer um, stiffness of yeah. a pair of proper riding boots. Yeah. Well, and so it, we had an opportunity to see some proper riding boots at John Lobb. Right. And they're heavy. Yeah, I mean, they're heavy. You know, the Solid. Hessian boots, yeah. I mean, yeah. are very heavy, very solid. Yeah. And you know you could almost knock on them. Exactly. I mean, you know, the uh, the leather is so thick and so stiff exactly. that I couldn't imagine them being comfortable all day yeah. long. Whereas if you feel the weight of that, it's got the weight of a boot. It mm -hmm. does feel like a boot. It's I quite mean, it's leather soles to be honest. But to be honest, it is still yeah. lightweight. It's not especially heavy. Look at that heel. Beautiful. Yeah, heel. beautiful shaped heel. Yeah. I mean, it's a classic bespoke build. Yeah. Um, so they've got a slight beveled waist here. Okay. So there is a a small amount of beveling through the waist there. They've got a beautiful, almost Cubanized heel yeah. there, if you actually look at it's it. It's a little bit it's exaggerated, yeah. It's exaggerated. Nice pitch. Clips in underneath there, yeah. And um, really, you know, quite a lightweight sole. This is not really for clumping about in the country. Yeah. This is for, and you think about that's probably a 3 16th, it's less than a quarter sole, probably even lighter than what you've actually got on your shoe really? here, really. So it's mm. quite a lightweight sole here. Um, uh, yeah, one of the ones that I pulled apart earlier, I mean, the, the, um, the sole, sort of there's nothing much of it really. Yeah. So it really does go to show, here's the square mm. waist here. And here's the bevel part of the waist heading yeah. up towards the heel there. These ones the are literally kind of remnants of Yeah, the that fill. was like a hay. It was like yeah. hay. I Stuffed couldn't believe it. When, yeah. I, when I pulled it apart, I was thinking, why? They didn't even. Well, they wouldn't have had things like roofing felt or yeah. cork or any of that stuff. They literally filled it full of grass and <laughs> hay. And here, there's the remnants of the hay. But again, beautiful small stitching on the yeah. outsole here. Um, a beautifully prepared insole here. Um, nice yeah. uh, channel, nice shape to it through yeah. there. Lovely uh, welt stitches yeah. running along. So what's Look interesting? The old flax, I mean, yeah, the old, the old. Here we are floating about. This is the old uh, flax and thread that they would have used to. But a quite beautifully thick. fine yeah. channel. Uh, yeah, they needed to have some strength when they were stitching the welt yeah. in there. They really need to have some strength to it there. And was this so, the insole that would have been on top of this? Yeah, so this that's the insole, set. so that's the set really. So when yeah. I pulled this apart for us to foot. take a look at, that really is the set. That was okay. the heel that's... sitting in there. That's the, so if we're looking at it from the bottom, and this would have the been heel. the repair, so they did like that's a half sole. Yeah, but actually this was this is just decoration here. Really? This was okay. the original sole on here. They they were never repaired these mm. boots, so that's the original sole and the original heel. Gosh. Um, that um, and this is so here. This is the actual. Other, this is the other one of the pair that I pulled apart. Mm -hmm. So you can actually see. Um, yeah, you know, at, even they've had work. some, yeah, beautiful work, even though it's been properly used and bashed about. There's a lovely beveled waist running through here, very thin soles stri stitched on here. So yeah. it's, uh, even it. though somebody uh, liked those and wore those and really enjoyed wearing them. And, uh, is this another repair right Yeah, here? this is repaired. I mean, ultimately at some stage, historically, the side seams have split there and there. Either that or he put on some weight and his calf got bigger. Yeah. And these were just put in to expand. rather crude, crudely just to expand yeah. um, the size of the boot, really. But it really showcases but, the durability of a boot like this. I mean, this is well yeah. over 100 years. Yeah. And, this is, yeah. you know, clearly had um, a lot of use in its lifetime. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, for the most part held up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, I mean, you do see many boots of this vintage. I mean, you know, this one has been bashed about a bit. These ones, uh, rather nicely, even mm -hmm. though I didn't pick them up with some trees, they haven't been bashed about quite so much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the heels, even though they've been quite worn down, I mean, obviously somebody used them a lot. But again, these are 
pre presumably bespoke boots made for this would have been an officer's boot no question Can you tell about who, that from whom it was made no i've no idea there's never um uh, uh, disappointingly there's never any makers names in a lot of these boots and as i said before you know with uh, 60 years ago within a sort of 5 mile radius of here there were a lot of boot makers mm -hmm. so there were a lot of unnamed boot makers just making yep. really nice really lovely work yeah and today in london then, i mean really the only bespoke bootmaker would be lob yes i mean lob a proper bespoke bootmaking firm bootmaking firm yeah. yeah i think a lobs are probably the only people that would make proper boots. yes yeah um and so yeah so the other thing so calf skin on the front and this this is what goes into the leg so if you feel that that wow. is what actually the legs are made out of and so this is goat you might, it's a goat skin okay yeah so wow. um, this so is a French soft. goat skin, so it's very soft, yeah. And it's you can see this is where the texture of the uh, leather comes from. That's where the texture of this surface mm -hmm. comes from, the texture of the goat. Yeah. Um, so it actually makes a boot which has got a very soft leg. So mm -hmm. it's only going to be lined in the top along here. The ones you're in your Maxwell's boots are lined just across the top there. And then that um, so the, the, all of the boot and all of the leg of the boot, unlike the cowboy boots, will be very soft and flexible, really. So yeah. the bottom, when you've actually got your trousers on, it'll look like you're just wearing a, a smart boot. Yeah. But the leg is um, very yeah. soft and uh, flexible. Hmm. So what about so the, the lasting process and the measurements? I mean, is it, a, is it built along like the same last you would use for an Oxford? No. It's a different last, okay. yeah. Primarily, the last vary in an, in three main ways. Um, firstly, um, the last is usually straighter at the back. Okay. Okay. So we need to straighten the last at the back. Um, there's usually what they would call a full instep measure across mm -hmm. here. So there's a wider instep measure, um, and finally, um, there's usually a bit more volume through the ankle part of the last as well. Okay. So to give you, because obviously what you're doing with a, a riding boot is you're actually encompassing and uh, surrounding the ankle as well. Mm -hmm. So you just need to have a slightly more room through here on this part okay. of the last. So, so the last need to be changed. But it, um, essentially we've got your last. So we've got the foot part of your last. We just need, need to make some alterations to the top part of the okay. last just to actually adjust yeah. it to take some boots. And what about the boot top? I mean, is that done on the last or how is that, how is that shaped? Well, that's all made flat. Um, that's made flat just with pattern making. So the pattern making on this kind of work is mm -hmm. really key because a lot of the time you're working off the foot. So you've mm -hmm. got the last on the foot part of the pattern making, but all of this is just made off the last on paper. Yeah. So it's all just done by calculating angles okay. and measurements and stuff like that. Yeah. So that's one of the other kind of key parts of yeah. this pattern making process. And it's not lasted on the tree like a riding boot. No, so this is, they're blocked on the trees afterwards. Okay. So usually you'd make the boot up flat like that. Okay. And then, so it would be floppy on the leg. Yeah. And then you'd go to the tree maker and you'd get the trees done and you'd actually get the trees to actually shape up Those are quite some trees. the Wellington. These are, a, yes, so here we are with the, a Wellington boot tree. So again, completely massive. different, massive. And well, this would, this would be too wide, obviously, for your leg yeah. and your calf measurement. This is, uh, um, this is really quite a substantial boot here. But um, that's the kind of thing that you end up getting wow. for a pair of trees. Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and today's video was brought to you by KirbyAllison.com, where you'll find the largest collection of luxury garment care and luxury shoe care accessories in the world, as well as other great clothing accessories for the well-dressed, like this sovereign grade necktie, pocket squares, braces, socks, and so much more. So if you enjoy the content that we film on this channel, make sure you visit KirbyAllison.com. This is a riding boot tree. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a completely different shape from uh, a Wellington boot tree. Yeah. The Wellington boot tree is very straight mm -hmm. and very structured. Here, a riding boot, we've got the front curve for the shin bone here. 
we've got uh, oh wow you can really see the yeah you can see shape. they're completely different apart from yeah. the heights they're just a completely different yeah. shape so and this bows this, out on there yeah this is giving the structure to a riding boot which is completely different yeah. shape um for the structure for a wellington boot. and a riding so, boot would be heavily structured all the way through the boot top all the way through the boot top yeah, yeah so the boot top for the riding boot is completely stiff yeah. and inflexible really mm -hmm. and it's designed in many ways to protect your leg yeah. as much as anything else you know yeah. when you're out hunting mm -hmm. and riding and jumping over hedges and stuff like that it's really designed to um take the scuffs and take the marks that the hedges are going to put in and the reason why the riding boots are made in reverse calf i.e with the reverse calf skin side inwards and the flesh side outwards is because you can repair the scuff marks yeah. on a riding boot. So once the flesh side gets damaged, mm -hmm. it's much easier to repair the scratches yeah. so and like the marks. So like the suede side. Yeah, the suede yeah. side. Yeah, the flesh side. And so that's Whereas, why that's why you know riding boots would be waxed calf, right? Yeah. So it's waxing that flesh side of the skin, and yeah. then it would be boned, boned, to, boned down. To make yeah, it look and that's smooth. what means that you won't once you uh, say you go through a hedge and it mm -hmm. scratches your boots is a yeah. hawthorn edge really yeah. badly scratched you can then dye those set them mm -hmm. back in and you can actually set the scratches away okay. you can't remove them entirely yeah. but you can bed them down yeah. and sort of you know yeah. burnish them, them burnish yeah. them and conceal mm -hmm. them yeah whereas if it's on the calf side if you can imagine if you scratch this side yeah. of the leather then it's kind of ruined really, really. Yeah. you just can't really do anything with it and it's like yeah. scratched yeah. so the other thing once they're once they're treed and blocked, even though they're soft, mm -hmm. the legs still retain some shape okay. as well. So, the, so like on a pair that you would make without the boot tree, it would still sit upright, or would it? Yeah, kind of well, without flop over um, a little bit more like that. Yeah, they they'd still sit upright mm -hmm. once they were treed, i.e., set on a tree. Mm -hmm. uh, they they maintain that shape. Yeah. Okay. But again, yeah. much different in the leg, softer in the leg, mm -hmm. a bit firmer where it's lined up at the top here. Yeah. So you can feel that, that it's a bit yeah. firmer up here. But all of this, it's designed to be soft and flexible mm -hmm. through that part of your leg, really. Yeah. That's beautiful work. And so, yeah. and you still make these. I mean, you make riding boots, you make yes. Wellington boots. Um, the demand is not great for them anymore, but yeah. um, it's always a joy to actually make yeah. them. Well, I know that I mean I've seen photographs again on your Instagram of you know your yeah. boot making work and I know just speaking with you that it's something you enjoy doing exactly because it's kind of a lost art I yeah mean, in exactly so many ways and it's one of the things that really you know you just have to keep on doing it because you know ultimately someone's got to practice these skills otherwise yeah. if no one actually makes any of these things then we'll lose these skills within yeah. a within a generation really yeah. and well, that'll be. Uh, I think that'll be a shame. Yeah, and the challenge with shoemaking is it's such an oral tradition that even if there's books talking about boot making, yeah, right, unless you have someone to show you and teach you firsthand, you really can't quite yeah. pull it all together, can you? Yeah. No. Well, interesting enough, there are books around telling you how to make this stuff. Okay. Yeah, and, um, and are they quite instructive? I oh, mean, could someone well, that's never that's never made a pair of Wellington boots pull it off? Interesting. Well, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, we're going to find out. We're going to find out. Yeah, we're going to. We might have to find out. Yeah, exactly. I mean, interestingly enough, I um I just I photocopied this. This is from the Art of Boot and Shoemaking, a practical handbook by John Bedford Leno. 1885. So this guy in 1885 wrote a book on how to make a Wellington boot. Okay. And very specifically, he wrote the bit I've highlighted there is he wrote the bit about how you actually sew the two uh, sides together. Mm -hmm. um, and I've just I just highlighted that um, because it really does give you an 18 what was it to say 1885. So probably. Mm -hmm. 30 years after the death of Wellington, he gives you quite detailed instruction for any um, Victorian bootmaker who wants to have a go at making yeah. a pair of Wellington boots, how to go about yeah. making them. I love this though. So, but for the, you know, for this purpose, a flax thread is used, the thickness of which must be regulated to the substance of the leather. Well, that's AKA, exactly that, you know. AKA. So look, <laughs> so here are our flax threads. This is exactly right. So here it is on the upper here with these tiny stitches yeah. here. Mm -hmm. It's the same thread that's made the welt stitches yeah. there as well. So 
This is exact. This is an illustration of exactly that very point. There, they're making the handmade threads mm -hmm. to different weights yeah. depending on what they're going to use. Which you still for. do today. Which I we mean, still we do today. You which you made that film of, you know, and that's exactly the, the process that you use to make lightweight threads for the for yeah. the low substance yeah. of the upper. And, and how, how long are they? What is it? The length of the, the kitchen. The length of the kitchen. <laughs> Always the length of the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. I don't care. I mean, intriguingly, Kirby, it goes on. To talk about, do you want to read the rest of that? Because there yeah. is um, there is something interesting that's worth. So reading. the back is first placed in the clams, grain side outwards and top facing the closer. The front like is held the same on the left side. Exactly like that. The small strip of leather that forms the welt is then placed between the front and the back. That forms the welt. Yeah. Now we know from welted shoes that's at that the, we think the bottom of the shoe. Yeah, exactly. What we think of as the welt is this bit that gets stitched on to the insole, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But of course, in this, they put another welt and they really? use the same word. There's a very small bit of fine vegetable tan leather called the welt, which is sandwiched between the front and the back of this. So, and what, I what mean, purpose does that serve? Well, it doesn't serve any purpose. It's really purely decorative. Okay. So on your cowboy boots, mm -hmm. I forget what they call it in cowboy boot, or Lee Miller calls it now. It's called beading or yeah. piping. Yeah, the piping. Between, there's some piping between mm -hmm. the back part of the boot and the front part of yeah. the boot. Originally, in 1885, it was called the welt, the welt. and it was a piece of vegetable yeah. tanned leather that went between the two. Not, be, not to be confused with the outsole welt. Not, <laughs> to be confu not to be confused um, with this welt, yeah. exactly. Huh. So that's just one of these interesting idiosyncrasies that you right. find. You know, how would one when, know this? How would you know, exactly. How would you know? Wow. In closing the sides, great care must be taken to keep the stitches regular formed at an equal distance from the edges. Yeah, exactly. So what they're basically saying, you've got to keep them all the same size, same amount from the yeah. edge there running along the sides there. Interesting. The welt cutter is now used to take the surpluses of the welt away and the, the welt, welt self cutter, setter my applied goodness. to a set really the welt. A really rare piece of a welt cutter. Really? I don't okay. think anyone's ever seen one of those before. That's wow. A, that is just one of the rarest And so this would just be run. Exactly, so once, they've, um, once you've actually stitched the welt in, you How many times do you reckon you've used this? Uh, about twice. <laughs> about twice. Really? Just yeah. twice. Um, and you were thankful to have it you yeah, know, for, for exactly. all the other times before you, you were know, doing before it. Before I had this, I was doing it in a slightly different way. And then luckily, Will William LeBeau, the yeah. chap who does mm -hmm. the shoemaker, shoemaker tool makers, tool makers yeah. yeah, rang up and said, Dom, you know what? Guess what I found you? It's uh, an original welt cutter. Who knows and, from how long ago? You know, who knows from how long ago? And I mean, who uses one of those nowadays. And but it would allow you yeah, to keep it straight. Exactly. Keep it straight and run it up the seam of the boot and it will just shave off. And as they say here, what do they say? You've got to be very careful. Um, uh, da, 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 the welt cutter is used to take the surplus of the welt away and the welt setter apply to set the welt up, yeah. which means that once it's wet, you then use like an iron, a fudging iron, yeah. to set the shape of the welt up yeah. the edge of the boot. Read this right. I don't know who yeah. Delvin is, but in opposition yeah. to Delvin, yeah. who's Delvin? I don't know. He yeah. was some other yes. boot mate. He wrote, he wrote the, the other book. book. He did write <laughs> the other book, actually, yeah. We believe that it is quite possible to put in too many stitches in closing the sides, in so much as overcrowding has a tendency to weaken the upper. Yeah, so yeah. if you actually perforate it mm -hmm. too much, yeah. if you put too you, many stitches... It can stitches, be too fine. Yeah, it can be too fine yeah. and the whole thing can break yeah. apart, really. Just like a perforated paper. So when you pull paper. it on, we well, you think you've got to understand that when you actually pull these things on, they're, the back is under a lot of pressure, yeah. you know, so there's a lot of stretching yeah. going on. Well, really. the same, I mean, so, we've spoken at, at length, you know, the two of us about that same principle applied to the outsole stitching. Yeah. Right, where, you know, if it can be too you know, fine. More is not necessarily better whenever yeah. it comes to that degree of finesse. Exactly. You can end up just perforating the leather. Yeah. So it can just literally have more holes yeah. and more threads and no leather in between them. Yeah. And if, if so, that happens, it makes it impossible to resole it then, which defeats yeah. the whole purpose of the welt. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So interesting stuff from 1885. Yeah, well, there we some go. Some, some, some boot late making, night literature to keep you up. Exactly. So just something for you to worry about when your boots are getting give made. Give that back to you. Just in case. Um, so then what happens so, next then? So this is an exciting project. I'm excited we're going to embark on. I'm, yeah. You know, it's our intention to hopefully be able to film a little bit of the actual yep. making with you. Yep. You know, to really kind of showcase the work that goes into the construction of a boot like this. Yeah. Uh, but you've got my lash. You've done several pairs yep. of absolutely lovely shoes for me. Um, 
So I'm just going to check some measurements, and I'm just going to take a couple of extra measurements as well. Okay. Um, I, I did send you a copy of Hobie's. Do you remember I showed yes. you a copy of Hobie's bill? I didn't have Here a chance to do that. Here we are. You can then. get them in the British Museum. Okay. Here is, there are, here's a copy of his one of his uh, invoices from 1818. To uh, I, I can never quite remember. Is that Major or General Major? Gunnery or anyway, yeah, I don't know. those were his boots. Who, whatever his name was. But what they used to do to send out to officers all over the British Empire was this little self-measuring tape uh, chart, really. Yeah. And um, just to show you uh, a couple of the extra measurements that we really need to take. So the calf, so, the length. The calf. Th so really, what we're looking at is with a boot like this is we're looking at something which is calf high, mm -hmm. really, or just, just above the calf. So it yeah. really wants to set really around about the widest part of the calf. Um, so we obviously need to know on your leg how high th the calf is, okay? We need to have a circumference measurement around the calf, probably one just around your ankle, and then we just need to check the heel measurements, your heel measurements. Okay. And then that's, uh, and then we can actually start on it from there, really. Yeah. I mean, we're in the advantageous position that we've already got a last, which mm. we know the shoe. So we yeah. know pretty comfortably that the shoe part's going to fit gonna you. Fit. Yeah. And what we've just got to do is start adjusting it for the boot okay. part of things. Would you make the toe shape different at all? I think probably give it a touch more volume. Yeah. Just to give it a slightly more rounded, yeah. uh, uh, Kind of aesthetic. Yeah, yeah. A, a rounded aesthetic. So yeah. not quite as sleek looking as um, your Oxfords. Okay. Um, and that's what we'll probably just do, adjust the toe. Yeah, great. But essentially that's all we need to do yeah. really, just to take a few extra yeah. measurements. Well, shall we take some measurements? Yeah, exactly. Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and thank you for watching today's video. If you enjoy the content that we film here on this YouTube channel, one of the best ways that you can support our ability to film even more great content is by visiting KirbyAllison.com, where you'll find the largest collection of luxury garment care, luxury shoe care, and other great clothing accessories for the well-dressed. Also, we have a Patreon page where 100% of the proceeds from our Patreon go to our ability to travel in pursuit of this quality craftsmanship and tradition. So if you love the content, these are two great ways to support what you see here on youtube.com slash Kirby Allison. So here we are back in yep. the measuring chair. Back in the chair. It's been too long. Yeah. So we've already got your last Kirby. So we know, uh, that the shoes are fitting you fine. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is I'm just going to look at what uh, Hobie did in 1810. And um, I'm gonna just check that I'm making the right <laughs> measurements here. But essentially what we need to do is we need to understand the height of the boot at the okay. back. So we need to know where your calf is going to come to. Um, we're going to then just check some heel measurements, the two heel measurements, the long heel line, which comes down to your cuneiform there, and the short heel line, which comes across there. And then I'll just check something around the ankle. Okay. But really just to, um, a number of more basic yeah. measurements for the boots. And we're in the lucky position that we've already got the um, measurements for, the, for your last, and we know that the last already fits you. So I can Fit use beautiful. that anyway. So that's what we need to do. So we've got the left and the right. Okay, shall we start at the, let's just start on, on the left, Kirby. So really what I need to know is the circumference of your calf, the widest part of your calf and the top, just so that we need to know what height I'm going to set okay. the top of the boot at. So, and we'll do that at, Just uh, thirty one, so we'll probably make them thirty inches, thirty centimeters high, just slightly below. So 30 centimeters, so we need to have a couple of circumference measurements at 30 around here. And of course, this is going to be not, this is the width of your leg, but we won't actually make the boot to the width of your leg. 
the left is 39 centimeters. Now let's just look at the right, Kirby. Can we just look at this one? Yeah, get that nice and straight for me. Thank you. Bring that down a bit, yeah. Oh, a bit wider. 40 and a half. Oh, better get it in the right place. Okay, so that's that. We'll just get the ankle measurements. Right is 28. Look, I'll finish off this then. The long heel line down onto your cuneiform. Which one? Which measurement? This is the long heel line measurement down onto your cuneiform bone there, in the middle mm -hmm. of your instep there. 38. And then the short heel line which brings us up onto this one here, which ties into the ankle measurement that I've just taken round there. Thirty-five. Okay, so just onto the left, so again, the ankle measurement round here. Twenty-eight, same as the other one. A rare example of uniformity. Yes, exactly. Look at that. Let's see. If we, let's see where we go with this one as well. Thirty-four, thirty-five on that one. Thirty-four, and the long heel line measurement here, around the back of the heel, onto the instep. Thirty-seven. 37, which is slightly smaller on your yeah. left foot from your right. Hmm. But that's it. That's yep. all we need to know for the boots. We know that we've got the last right for all of the foot side. Okay. So really what we're going to be doing is making some adjustments through the back here mm -hmm. and across the instep here. Just yeah. to allow, and then the rest is going to be done on the actual paperwork by actually making the pattern. Pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There we are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dominic, I mean, you never cease to bring surprises and adventures uh, to, to the table fun. here. So uh, yeah, I always enjoy my time so much. And again, yep. thank you so much for your generosity of kind of just sharing this knowledge with us. I mean, uh, there's just so much history behind shoemaking. Yeah. Again, it's that quality, that craftsmanship. And here, seeing the tradition uh, is one of the things that just continues to uh, just enamor me with yeah. uh, with this this craft. Yeah. Well, we're very lucky in that um, you know you're happy to share it. So yeah. it's really we're lucky that you can actually put some of this stuff yeah. out. Well, thank you for allowing us to do that. Pleasure. And uh, this is we'll look to very the exciting. Yeah. So uh, hopefully this is something. I know you're you're quite busy. You're a victim yeah. of your own success. Oh yeah. But we'll yeah. try to slip this project in somewhere. We will. And uh, get yeah. the crew down, you know, to yeah. uh, Eastbourne to do some filming in the beautiful yeah. British, British countryside. Yep, come they, down to East Sussex. They get to have all the fun. The weather's great. Yeah. <laughs> the guards are What's cooler than it is here in London at the yeah, moment, that's isn't for it? sure. What yeah. a stay in London so far. Yeah, well, Dominic, great. I'm so excited about this. And, Lovely uh, to see you. you Thanks know, again. Bark on another adventure together. Super. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.